Um, actually, this connects very nicely to the previous talk, because the previous talk was all about you know, how AI can, can help us as humans make decisions. And this talk is going to be how to even not do that, how to even not make the decisions. So slowly, every talk that happens, there is less of a job, right? That's what I'm trying to. No, it's actually better, but um, it gets scary before it gets better, I think. So a little bit about me. Uh, I wrote a book called The Art of Unit Testing. I'm actually rewriting it these days for JavaScript, because, you know, JavaScript. Um, and uh, I wrote a book about elastic leadership, which is all about how to lead technical teams. And the reason I wrote that book is because I was leading technical teams, and everything I tried failed. So everything that I thought had to work in some way, in my head, I ha already had the perfect vision of how things had to work in the team. And then when it came to the team, everyone was like, yeah, absolutely. And then nothing changed. So I wrote that book to try to understand why I couldn't change anything. And I'm currently writing a third book called Pipeline Driven, which is all kind of connecting all these dots. Uh, how do we change, change an organization? How do we get testing to the forefront? Uh, what do pipelines have anything to do with that? And what is the role of QA? in the new world, which I call pipeline-driven. Um, so everything you're going to hear today comes from personal experience, either consulting or training customers, or just working in uh, a bunch of different companies. One of those companies was Dell EMC, by the way. I was working at EMC and then got bought by Dell, so stock vested in first year. That was nice. Um, uh, and then a year after I left. But that's a story for the speaker dinner. Okay. So everything I'm going to talk about, you can find on the website. By the way, you cannot see this. Is there a way for us to move this? I'm sorry, Attila, where are you? Because people can't see half the screen. So we're talking about usability, integration, customer focus, oriented. Is there a way for us to kind of try to move this? Thank you. Appreciate it. True agility, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, okay, okay. You don't have to. Pity. Applause. Okay, so the three things we're going to talk about um, are pipelines, how, why, and how white matters to us. Because most of the time, what I see from organizations is that QA and a lot of other people in the organization are looking at pipelines as if they're kind of the enemy or as if it has nothing to do with them or as if it has something to do with just a secret organization inside the organization called the ops team, which is, of course, a huge anti-pattern. And I'll talk about the role of a test architect and how I think that fits into a better vision of the future in a pipeline-driven organization. And I'll talk about test recipes as one possible technique that we can use to bring dev and QA actually working together again, like God intended. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is why the hell should you care, okay? What's the point of making all these changes? What's the point of this talk? The point of this talk is everyone is going through this huge change. I'm not even talking about AI yet. I'm talking about before AI. I'm talking about that whole automation boom that everyone keeps talking about like it's already over, but 90% of the companies that I go through it's not even started yet. It's like the dinosaur is still out there, and everyone is trying to move it away, and everyone is even trying to do automation, but there is so much organizational complexity, organizational bureaucracy, and a lot of it, unsurprisingly, has to do with people. People are the most complicated thing that we can ever put in software. People are the reason we have problems in software. If we could get rid of people, Technically, our job would be easier, because computers do exactly what we tell them to do. Except AI. That's completely a different area. It doesn't always do what we tell it to do. I'm not even getting into that. OK, so continuous delivery is something that all organizations are currently trying to do. In fact, most organizations have said they already do it, which is, of course, completely false. Most organizations say they do Agile, which is false. They say they do continuous integration, which is false. They say they do you know, uh, continuous delivery, which is very much false. 
And how do I know this? Well, look at these companies, the Netflix, the Googles, the Facebooks, all of these you know, unicorns that you hear about, and we are trying to learn continuous delivery from these companies. What separates them from us? The regular day-to-day -day companies that are trying to achieve the same thing. I want to do the stuff that Netflix does. What's the difference between my organization and their organization? Why are they able to do it? Why can they deploy hundreds of times a second? I don't know. What's the difference? So here's the difference. Here's what I see in real organizations. Because in real organizations, you do have Jenkins jobs or Team City or TFS. You have all of these kind of jobs lying around, but that's not continuous delivery. That's a big difference between having a bunch of automated jobs versus continuous delivery or even continuous integration. So here's one of the differences. So in many organizations, there is a pipeline that dev can run. And then after that pipeline that dev has run, someone from dev comes and says, OK, testers, you can go ahead and take this and run it in your own pipeline. That's, a, that's where we should start suspecting everything, OK? And then testers say, OK, we'll run it. And then our automated tests, because we are doing continuous integration and all that stuff, false, is going to pass. And then we're going to tell you know, uh, the ops people, hey, I think the release is ready, so please go ahead and deploy all that amazing stuff. And the ops people are saying, OK, we're going to run our own pipelines to make sure, because we don't trust your pipelines. Because what do I know about the stuff that you ran? And just in case, we're also going to do a bunch of other testing that nobody ever told you I'm going to do. And I'm going to deploy in a different way that you thought I was going to deploy, which is a lot of times manual. And then they might go into a different location. You know what? Maybe security. Security is now taking over and saying, hold on, hold on. All of you amateurs can just sit there and be nice. I am the decider. I make a decision whether this stuff actually gets somewhere. You want to open a firewall? You got to get through me, buddy. So they have their own automated tests. They have manual tests. They have all their own metrics. Everyone has their own pipeline. So now we have organizations full of pipelines. But it takes us five months to get to production. So what is this? This is a waterfall pipeline. And what's the difference between that and the Netflixes of the world? There's people between the pipelines. Okay. If there's people in the middle, we can think of this whole thing as a huge pipeline. right? This is our, deli our true delivery pipeline in terms of a value stream. The only thing it's missing is the creation of the requirements, you know, in the creation of the design. There is a bunch of stuff on the left that's not fully there yet, so it's not a complete value stream. But from the moment development begins, we can treat it as an organizational pipeline. It's a pipeline of pipelines. So what's the difference in those other companies? They don't have people in the middle. That's one of the main simple and, of course, completely crazy differences between those places and this. So if you don't have people in the middle of this, and this whole thing runs automatically, so if one pipeline passes, the other pipeline automatically starts. We can treat each pipeline like its own set of jobs, right? It's, it's very easy. We can even you know, we can paralyze things. Right? We can make things run faster. And if all of the different sub-pipelines pass, hey, why, why don't we just also get compliance in there and security? Right? We can all kind of have our own automated pipelines that make specific decisions for us. And that's the difference. In those other companies, they let the pipelines make tactical day-to-day -day decisions. I'm not talking about AI and whether specific something is, makes sense or an Oracle-related stuff. I'm talking about tactical day-to-day -day decisions. For example, if, if all of these people above and under, instead of making the decisions on their own, would teach the pipeline how to make a decision. By the way, how does a pipeline make a decision? Can anyone tell me? How does a pipeline make a decision? Sorry? Fail or pass, right? A pipeline makes a decision very easily. It's a binary decision. It's either red or green. And it's red or green based on what? A test. It could be a single test that makes the whole pipeline red or green, correct? So all the tests have to be green from all the people there. So all the people at the top and the bottom teach the pipeline how to make their own decisions by writing automated tests that will run inside the pipeline. That's what most of these organizations are doing. 
they create automated pipelines that they can trust just enough so they don't have to make those decisions. So what happens now? Well, instead of merging a feature from one branch to another, the pipeline does the merge. Well, how does it know that it's okay? All the tests are passing. Instead of uh, QA approving a feature, by the way, this is to me is crazy. I, okay, I, I, I don't know why, but it's crazy to me that QA has to approve a release or a feature. Because I've been to those organizations where before a release, and especially before after a release that is the third release after uh, two other failed releases, the QA person has to sign in blood that this release is okay. Their hands are shaking, sign to us that this release is okay. If I was a person, I am a person. But if I was a, a QA in that specific organization, and someone told me, you have to sign off that all of these people for the past month have done amazing work, and there should be no issues for the customer, I would be shaking, okay? Many parts of me would be shaking, and I wouldn't be able to stop it. So what would I do? I would sign. I would say, hold on, let me just verify it just for myself, because I... It's not their job on the line, it's my job. So if it's my job on the line, I'm gonna make a lot of different stuff. It's gonna take me a long time because I'm gonna be afraid signing off that stuff. What if a pipeline signs off? What if we all agree as an organization, which is what these other organizations did, that if the pipeline is green, we just deploy. The pipeline is green, we merge. If the pipeline is green, it's not a single person's fault. If the pipeline is green when it was not supposed to be green, it's everyone's fault because we didn't teach the pipeline how to make a proper decision. Now, sometimes the pipeline will be green and we'll still find bugs. Does that happen when humans apply and sign off? It happens all the time anyway. The only difference is that whenever we find bugs in production, we teach the pipeline new stuff because obviously it didn't know enough. What about security? Instead of security doing manual testing, security already has everything they need to do automated. In fact, they do automated testing. They just have their own little pipeline that they run, their own little scripts. Security is nothing if not automated, okay? In terms of um, um, uh, uh, um, checks for firewalls and intrusion detection and, uh, and code uh, and, uh, analysis, there is a bunch of stuff that is done, but it is orchestrated by a human and it is signed off by a human. So what if a pipeline just said, no, based on my tests that the human has taught me, this is all green. If this is all green, everything is good to go. But ops, setting up environments. No, 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 hold on. The ops person has to say the environment is okay. And then they have to configure that environment. And then they have to say, no, not between nine and five. You cannot use that environment. Screw you. Why do you decide for me if I can use an environment? What if I had automated tests that loaded up the environment, ran in the environment, and killed the environment, right? That's what a pipeline is supposed to help us with, all those tactical day-to-day -day decisions. Security, ops, we can also add to that um, <coughs> compliance. Compliance we don't talk about much, but compliance can also be automated in terms of checking things checking that specific test results exist, checking that specific documents exist and are being signed, you can automate that stuff much easier than you think in most organizations. So the biggest point that I like about letting the pipeline make a decision is no stress. Because either the pipeline is green or the pipeline is red, and it's all of our jobs to make the pipeline better. Now, when I suggest this to organizations, what usually the result is, um, no way will I let an automated pipeline release this software into production. And you're insane for even suggesting it. Now, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that eventually the pipeline should be trustworthy enough that when it's green, it's already deployed, which is why we could have featured flags and single branch model and a bunch of other things that support this behavior. So we have to trust the pipeline. So what does it mean to trust the pipeline? That it should fail when it should, right? So in this new world of a pipeline-driven organization, which is what I believe we're moving into, a pipeline-driven organization is not just an organization that has pipelines. It's an organization where pipelines make tactical day-to-day -day decisions 
without humans in the middle. And in this type of organization, which if we think about it, what is DevOps? It's the combination of operational decision making in an automated fashion. What if DevSecOps? It is the automation of security decisions in an automated pipeline. Dev test ops, AI ops, all of these words are trying to describe a single thing to me, a pipeline-driven organization. So instead of inventing these new words, let's just assume that we're all trying to work against a single pipeline. And that single pipeline is going to be the part of our goal as developing the software. So 50% of the time could be me just working on the pipeline instead of manually making decisions. <clears throat> so how do we participate? Well, a pipeline to me is basically kind of like the UN. So in the UN, you have a bunch of other different countries, each one with their own interests, and they send their delegates into the UN assembly, and then they vote. Now, a little differently than, uh, than uh, in a pipeline, here we have humans, but in a pipeline, we can have all of these other different interests teaching various locations in the pipeline how to vote. So it only takes a single vote to break the pipeline, and a single vote is a failed test, as we said before. So all I need to do is know how to veto. So does anyone know how to veto a pipeline? How do pipelines know if they failed or not? Does anyone know? The people who said they're working with pipelines. Sorry? Yes, but how do they know that a test failed? Yes, the automation, but how do we know the automation? How does the automation recognize the test failure? Does anybody know? Sorry? I don't understand. Okay, whatever you guys said, I'm not sure that, you, that I agree with you. Okay, I may not understand, but I'm 95% sure that was wrong. which is what a product owner usually says. Okay, so here's how. You exit a process with a non-zero result. That's all you have to do to break a pipeline. Am I wrong? Am I right? If you want to break a pipeline, any process that wants to break a pipeline only has to do this exit with a non-zero. In fact, the one thing that continuous integration servers and automated test scripts and processes have in common, they all agree non-zero means failure, okay? If you want to veto something, all you have to do is to write a simple script or a simple piece of code that returns non-zero, that exits the process with non-zero. Automatically, most, I don't know of any pipeline that won't recognize this as a failure. Why is this important? If you, if you think about any test framework that you run, when one of the tests fails, it literally returns, at the end of the run of all the tests, it returns a non-zero exit code. That's how we know that a test failed. Okay, you just heard the test fail. Okay? Okay, so that's how you veto a pipeline. Why would you even want to participate in a pipeline? What's in it for you to work in that pipeline-driven organization? I mean, first of all, we can agree that this is where the future is headed. Whether we agree with the idea of continuous delivery or not, this is what most organizations are trying to accomplish today anyway. So at the very least, we have to decide whether we're part of it or we're not. And what you see in many organizations, what I see, is a lot of people are either trying to fight it or they don't realize that they have to jump into it. It doesn't just happen to testers. If I talk to developers about continuous delivery, a lot of developers don't realize just how many new skills they have to learn about automated testing and test architecture and infrastructure and understanding the pipelines. If I talk to ops, and notice I don't say DevOps, no such thing as DevOps people, there's ops folks, they have IT knowledge, they just, somebody changed their name. So if I talk to these people and they have a specific experience, but in a pipeline-driven world, a lot of their experiences are not good enough. They don't know how to work with automated pipeline. They don't know how to write automated test infrastructure, uh, automated uh, infrastructure as code related tests. They don't know how to work with, they have to learn all of these new things, right? So today, what we, most of these people are trying to learn is Docker and Kubernetes and all of these stuff. But really, what's going to end up happening is that all of these people are going to realize that they have to learn how to coach other people to do those skills 
because that's part of their job. In fact, the ops people have to learn how to code. Most of them either only know very basic scripting, but they're going to have to learn how to code tests into the automated pipeline so that we know that an environment is OK up and running, that creating an environment has succeeded or not. The pipelines have to make a decision. Security has to learn all of these, all of these new skills. And security, I, I would say that ops are on the way, and dev are definitely on the way. Security is very much far away from this world just yet. In most organizations that I see, security folks are still kind of this abandoned section, like at the corner of the warehouse, where there's maybe a couple of people, and they're making decisions for huge organizations. They're just, and they're huge bottlenecks in the organization, whether they like it or not. They don't realize just how much they need to participate in a pipeline because nobody ever told them that. But to me, this is part of development. This is supposed to be part of that. Otherwise, there will be no continuous delivery because there will always be that waterfall pipeline that has to do with security. And of course, testers. Testers, you, I think everyone here is already feeling a lot of the pains that we're talking about right now. Maybe you've already been forced to learn some of that. Maybe you're afraid that if you don't learn it, you're going to be left behind. I've seen organizations that have removed the idea of the word tester from their ranks and have turned testers into coders. So they literally put them in coding uh, courses, and they are transforming them into coders that also know how to test. And I think this is, in sometimes, I think this is actually a healthy thing because Part of the skills that testers need in a pipeline-driven organization are definitely coding, because without coding, we are not able to teach the pipeline how to make tactical day-to-day -day decisions. And if we're not able to do that, we have to resort to human decisions, and then we have to sign off on a release again. And of course, getting a pipeline to be signing off on a release is something that is an organizational issue. It's part of a process. It's a thing that takes time to get the leadership into. But at the very least, we should create the runway so that when they say, OK, let's give it a try, we have a pipeline that actually makes some decisions. Um, so test infrastructure, coding, automated testing if you're doing manual testing, pipeline integration, working with the pipeline, changing and adding steps to a pipeline. Editing Jenkins files is, a important, is an important skill for all of these professions, all of these categories. So instead of thinking full stack, think cross stack. Okay, Cross stack, the unicorns of tomorrow are people that have some knowledge in all of these things. They will be expert in one of these but they will have some knowledge to the point where if a pipeline fails, they will be able to understand why the pipeline failed in terms of what the error is and either understand that they're not able to handle it or understand that they can and they can do something about it. If a script has changed, maintaining the pipeline is going to be, a, to me, a daily part. And if we think about these organizations, the Netflixes, etc., this is what they do. They already told the pipelines, it's okay, we're good. If you're green, we're good. If you're red, well, I guess we'll just keep working until you're green again. They've already trusted their pipelines, which is the difference, to me, between continuous, true continuous delivery and what we're attempting to do at organizations, which is putting people in the middle of pipelines. So what's in it for you? Well, the good news is, other than just having less stress because a pipeline has been red, and then you can just say, well, the pipeline is red. Let's go check it out and fix whatever it is. Instead of just that stress, you have to think about job security. It's really funny, but in a pipeline-driven organization, everything is a test. Every decision is a test. And who are the masters of testing? The people in this room. The people in this room have been looking at testing and thinking about all these different ways of looking at problems, and they have a lot more knowledge and a lot more context usually about the application being tested that's running through the pipeline than most of the other people in the other categories. So they become not only testers, they become test architects. They teach people how to think about tests. They coach people how to come up with new test ideas because those test ideas then get coded and put into a pipeline. I'm not talking about exploratory testing. That is an AI thing, and I'm not there yet. 
I'm talking about way before. I'm talking about, of course, the boring stuff, the repetitive stuff. The stuff that we don't want to repeat, we let the pipeline repeat. We focus on more interesting problems instead of doing all those manual stuff. For example, if I'm no longer doing manual testing, what am I going to do all day? And the answer is, of course, at the beginning, you're going to study a lot about coding and how to write automated tests and about test infrastructure. So all of that time that you're spending today manually testing can be stand, spent on learning how to add tests to the pipeline for the first few months. Then after that, you can start focusing on higher level things. For example, test infrastructure, for example, different types of testing problems, or maybe adding more abilities to the pipeline. And of course, in terms of professionalism, we all want to get better continuously. We all want to have a great resume. We all want to be hireable to the point where it's undeniable. It's undeniable that we need that person in our organization. And today, if organizations are looking for people who are testing, that do tests, that are test experts, they're not looking for people that don't know how to code, as, as far as I can tell. I haven't seen that. The new world is looking for people that have multidisciplinary knowledge. So part of the professionalism is jumping into those places which could be quite scary, which could be quite unnatural, which could feel um, frustrating and annoying. And I would say that's a good thing. If you're feeling frustrated and annoyed, it means you're learning something new. And all of those people that I showed before, all of these categories, they're all feeling just as annoyed, just as frustrated. Some of them have just started a bit earlier than what testers are doing. And I can't wait until the security folks jump into this. It's going to be so much fun. I mean, the opposite of fun, but never mind. OK, so I'm going to show one thing that we can do to slowly get there. And this practice, which I call test recipes, is, is a practice that I've implemented in several locations. Uh, well, not implemented, but helped companies try to integrate. And it's slowly going. Some companies, it has made an impact to the point where there is true communication and actual work in a pipeline-driven fashion. So I want to introduce the role of a test architect. A test architect is, gr is good for two reasons. First of all, politically, in an organization that doesn't want testers, a test architect is not a tester, it is a test architect, which is much easier to sell to managers because that person is not only in charge of, is no longer in charge of manually testing things, they're in charge of coaching and teaching other people and help to plan test architectures and help to make sure that the testing that we are going to start teaching everybody in the organization actually makes sense. Because if you let a bunch of coders with no experience uh, uh, doing testing, uh, you're going to just let them free. What happens is they're going to make a lot of mistakes for the first year or two, which means for the first year or two until they realize just how many things they're missing and how many holes in their thinking they're missing because they've not read most of the books that testers have read. They've not read a lot of strategy about how testing is supposed to happen and, and how to think about a specific problem. They haven't, most of them don't know who James Bach is and they don't know about all of these different ideas of, of how, to, how to look at a specific problem and from different angles. And as a developer, I can tell you, that's exactly what I felt when I started doing automated testing for the first time. It was like, well, I guess code is code, so this is now code for a test. Is it a good test? What is, what is a good test? How do I know it's a good test? How do I know I'm not missing anything? Well, works on my machine, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where we've already lost. So coaching is a big part of what test architects do and not manual testing. Part of it will be helping to plan and being part of the discovery team. Part of it is coding tests along with developers. And the, the practice that I want to introduce is called a test recipe. It might look a bit familiar, but it's different than what you're thinking it is. So this is specifically a, something that uh, I felt made sense for a, uh, a, an organization that's being in transition. Okay, they're transitioning from the standard, you know, uh, traditional waterfall pipeline into what we're trying to achieve, which is a more communal, uh, collaborational pipeline. And we want to have continuous integration and maybe continuous delivery in the future. How does that world look 
with QA inside it. And to me, the, the it's not solution, but a, a key point that brings about coaching from one end and coaching to the other end, uh, so both, both uh, types of categories of people learn from each other the most, is called a test recipe. So this is what a test recipe looks like. Very overwhelming, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be a piece of paper. In fact, most of the time, I will uh, ask a team to just write this list in, a, uh, in the work item, in a JIRA or whatever it is, right under the requirement. So I'll explain what this is. Um, what, let's see if this works. No, yeah, there it is, okay. So at the top, we have the name of the feature, and then we have a bunch of scenarios. At the beginning of each scenario, we have the type of test that's going to run, like unit test, API, end-to-end, -end, and I'll explain how we choose the type of test in a second. And this test recipe is created by two people, not by one person. It is created at the beginning of work on a feature. So if the iteration started here, and now we're starting to work on a single feature, we, uh, we basically have a five or 10 minute meeting, QA plus developer assigned to the specific uh, feature. And together they create this basic list of scenarios. And they're saying, okay, um, I think that uh, if I wanted to know that this feature is working, I definitely want to test that you can do authentication with this, or what if the user doesn't exist yet, or what if the network is off, and a bunch of different kind of scenarios. Kind of a brainstorming session. We don't say at which level it is. We just brainstorm. And the idea of the brainstorming is, first of all, between a, 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 a test architect and developer to teach the developers how to think like testers. Because developers will usually come up with m much less scenarios and they're gonna come up with very basic ones because developers are usually used to testing their own code in some way and proving that it works. And testers are tr usually used to proving that code doesn't work. So the scenarios could be very, very different and sometimes even violently different. The disagreements can be very interesting, but it's the conversation that is the important part. So first of all, they sit together in the same table and they actually work together for five or 10 minutes and they agree what should be done. Then they agree at which level each test should be probably written, each scenario. Most of the tests will end up being written as unit tests or maybe API tests. And then some of the tests, a very small amount, will end up being end-to-end -end tests or UI tests. Because we, the, the cost of those tests, the maintainability cost of those tests is very, very high, but we still need the confidence that they provide to us. And I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, well, Roy, come on, don't bullshit a bullshitter. This is a test plan. If I've ever seen a test plan, we have a bunch of those. We've been doing it. Come on, we already have a test plan. Just open this different tool in a different browser with a different password, and oh, oh, the network is down, so never mind. I mean, but technically we have a test plan. I can't reach it right now, but it's amazing. Once you see it, you're gonna love it. And every time we update a feature, we go and we update the other test plan, et cetera. This is completely different than what I'm suggesting here. What I'm suggesting is a just-in-time list being created by two people just before development and being maintained just under the feature request itself. And this list is an example of a definition of done. The, the feature doesn't move to done before all of the test recipes passing. So if I'm working between dev and the test architect, and we're working on this feature on the left, and once we've agreed on this kind of set of scenarios, we split up and we both work on the test recipe, which means that a lot of the time is spent automating the test from the test recipe, and each person will automate the test that they know how to automate, and if they don't know how to automate any of the tests, they will spend the time learning how to automate the tests, until maybe in the next time they'll be able to automate all of the tests, um, or most of the tests. And usually what ends up in organizations that are transitioning is that the test architects end up automating the higher level tests, and the developers usually automate the unit testing related scenarios, if they're doing test-driven development, which I highly recommend, but again, that's a different conversation for a different day, it's already um, part of the work. They're just thinking about the scenarios. 
So done means all of the tests in the test recipe, the scenarios, are passing. So they should both agree, are all of the, if, if all of these tests here are passing, are we good? Do we have enough confidence in the feature if all of these are passing? And the answer should be yes. And if it's not, then what other scenarios are we missing here that will bring that confidence? So now, instead of having a feature developed and then moved over to testing, there is no testing column in the board. There is only the test recipe, and both testers and developers are in charge of moving things to done. If I'm moving something to done and part of the test recipe is not working, it gets moved back to uh, in progress. Okay? There is no such thing as moving into testing after development, and then a bug gets created because that feature has a bug. No. If, it ha if, if, if a bug gets created, it means that the test recipe is not passing. Or maybe we're missing something in the test recipe, so we add that line to the test recipe, and then we make that pass, and only then we, we move it to done. So there is no like a back and forth. There is only a fourth. And two people are in charge of that. Um, let's see, what are we missing? Okay. Um, so how do we choose the tests that go in to the strategy? Um, if we start with just a, single, uh, a bunch of scenarios, we don't even write uh, the level, and then we end up with something that looks like this, how did we decide what goes where? And I've seen organizations kind of struggle with this for a lot, and of course, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, already know about the testing pyramid, so I don't have a pyramid, I have a square, because I like to keep things different. Um, this square is different because I'm not using it just to show amounts, I'm using it to show coverage. So for a specific feature, the coverage is everything under that feature. So a feature could be tested in multiple levels. Right? I could test the same feature for auth at the end-to-end -end level, I could test it at the API level, I could test the unit test level, component level, there are a bunch of different levels. And most organizations, the question is, well, which level should we choose? And at some point, they just have to make a decision. So some organizations go with this. Why do they go with this? A multitude of reasons. Some of them are, it's actually sometimes easier to write the end-to-end -end test, at least the first few. A, a few weeks later, life becomes a living hell, but the first few weeks were really nice. Now, the maintainability aspect of this is horrible, but the confidence aspect of this is actually pretty good. In fact, if I could come up with a way to just write end-to-end -end tests for the entire set of my code, that would be maintainable and would run fast enough, that wouldn't be a nightmare to maintain. Uh, maybe I'll probably do it if it was easy to write all of these tests, but it's not. I want the confidence, but the payment is too high if I, if I test all of the features this way. Some organizations are more developer-centric. They don't have testers, they just have a bunch of unit tests. Now, the problem with this, well, first of all, the, the, the nice thing about this is it's really fast. We all agree, the feedback loop is amazing. The unit tests themselves only bring a certain level of confidence. They don't bring enough confidence. So technically, we don't know that the system actually works as a system. We just know that specific pieces of logic work isolated from each other. So some organizations have this, and some organizations have this. And this, to me, is the communication gap between dev and QA. Maybe you have that as well. QA is working on their own tests with their own repository. Dev is working on their own tests with their own repository. Nobody knows what the other is doing. Nobody cares what the other is doing. If one is failing, I don't even know that it's failing. If I ever come into the QA room and I see a red screen, I'm like, yeah, that's been red for like two weeks. Good luck with that. And if the QA is coming to the dev room and they see a test, they're like, ah, I guess something is red. I have no idea. They don't care what failed, why it failed, because they're working on different goals, unfortunately. And the reason they're usually working on different goals is because of organizational structure, or also because of the process. The process requires them to work on different goals, and one of the best ways to work on different goals is to have different systems for managing the tests, which is, again, one of the reasons that I don't like to manage test plans in a different tool, but I like to manage them in code where everyone can access them, not in a different repository, but in a single repository in the, in the application, so everyone can take a look at the test and actually maintain them. So what do we want to end up with? Well, I don't want to pay the entire price of running all the tests at the end and, and having them run for, let's say, eight hours, because then it means I can only have a nightly build. And if I can only have a nightly build, it means that any release, any continuous delivery is at minimum 
24 hours, right? So the faster I get feedback on the entire set of tests is the minimum amount where technically if I trust the pipeline, I can deliver. So if we run those end-to-end -end tests, which usually also run the unit tests, so we run them once a week, then our continuous delivery most optimized, right, the perfect vision in the company is one week uh, for a specific release or a bug fix, assuming that we don't trust the pipeline fully. So what we want to end up with, to me, is kind of like this. So for a feature, let's see. So if you have a feature here, I have a happy scenario. Some of you are already like, happy scenario. Um, and then the happy scenario is part of the feature, but then all the variations, I don't want to pay the price, so I write the variations at a lower level. And again, the variations should be uh, limited until I can get to the lower level. So these scenarios are different from these scenarios that are different from the top scenario. The top scenario is kind of like a clothing line. I was looking at this, you know, the lamp right above you, right? Um, looks like it's not going to fall, so everything is okay. So this lamp is held by a single pole, okay? And that pole is connected to the, to the ceiling. That single pole, that's our end-to-end -end test. We need that end-to-end -end test. It holds the confidence that given all of these components together, they're connected. But then all of the variations are all the other smaller lamps connected to it. Okay, uh, a, a series of one, uh, a ratio of one to five, one to ten at least, as far as I can see. And what we end up with is that we have confidence, but the feedback loop is much faster. Because for any variation that depends on this one top level path, I only write the faster tests for the variations for it. So if I have authentication and a happy path, I don't need to test that authentication with the lower level API connection is working again. For the other variations, I might write unit tests or API level tests that simulate many more complicated situations but are much faster. So eventually what I'd like to do is to have many more of these than, than these, than these, but I'm not gonna let go of the top. So in the test recipe, when I work on the test recipe and we go through the entire thing, one question has to rise up. Do we already have an end-to-end -end test that we can trust? And if we don't already have an end-to-end -end test that we can trust, uh, then we definitely need one. And that would be part of the work, part of the test recipe. But sometimes you won't need it. In fact, I would say 80% of the time, after you've done the initial few clothing lines that hang together the entire application and paths, you can just deal with API and unit test levels, which are much faster, easier to maintain, and a much less of a pain uh, in the, uh, I'm going to say, ass. OK, so these are, these are the, 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 the colors. We get faster feedback loop. We get higher confidence, less waste, and we work together. So the responsibility has changed. Instead of just having automated tests, we have a definition of done that two people are in charge of. So when we're do doing the daily meeting, we are asking two people, how is the test recipe going? What's going on with that? And if someone has moved something into done, then the question becomes, are all the tests in the test recipe passing? And if the answer is no, it shouldn't be done. So just to conclude, pipelines, awesome, very nice. We have to learn to live with them whether we like them or not. If we have decided we're going to learn to live with them, we're going to have to adapt ourselves to them. Because eventually, that's where the world is going. I'm not even talking about AI, right? I'm just talking about the basic day-to-day -day tactical stuff. Pipelines that make decisions instead of people actually relieve the stress that we feel every day. Now, of course, from a political standpoint, it seems like this is an impossible task. But what I can tell you is that many more managers are trying to get automated are trying to get pipelines to the point where they are moving to continuous delivery. And so maybe that task is not going to be as complicated as you think. The collaboration is the key aspect. This is what brings us together. This is where we're supposed to be working together uh, as a real team. If you want to learn more, I'm writing about it at the blog at pipelinedriven.org or the other blog, which is fivewise.com, which is all about the leadership stuff. Or you can just tweet me at uh, Roy Osharov. Thank you very much, everybody. May the force be with you. <laughs>